it's a time clock game. You know, you are racing mm-hmm. the clock because if you are, you know, have a loan, you got hard money, you got a high interest rate. Every day you don't sell that property is a day you're losing money, right? Yeah, so exactly. that sucks tremendously. With mm-hmm. multifamily, it's not like that. One, you've got professional management companies that you can employ. Two, you're making money every day if it's occupied. And right. what you're really doing is managing the business plan. You know, you're managing the execution of that business plan, but it's not like you're racing against the clock. You know, mm-hmm. you can always, a lease is going to come up and you're going to try to do whatever you need to do to push rents on that lease. Welcome back, everyone, to the Passive Road to Retirement podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Jarrett. Today, we're joined by John Kasman. John is a real estate entrepreneur who has partnered with busy professionals to invest in over $100 million worth of apartments. John also consults active multifamily investors to help them start or grow their business. He hosts the Multifamily Insights podcast, formerly Target Market Insights, and is a co-creator of the Midwest Real Estate Networking Summit. Prior to becoming a full-time investor, John worked in corporate America, overseeing marketing campaigns for General Motors, Nike, and Coors Light. John, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me, Andrew. Great. Yeah, great to have you on. So maybe uh, for those who don't know you, you can give us a little bit uh, more detailed background and, and how you, you know, switched over to real estate. Absolutely. So listen, I uh, started in corporate marketing. So I spent uh, 15 years in advertising and marketing for some of the companies you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I worked at General Motors on the agency side. I worked on campaigns for Mountain Dew, Nike, Coors Light, and other brands. And for me on the real estate side, really it started with uh, my transition from automotive and being in Detroit to uh, moving to Chicago and starting with a house hack. So I started with a house hack, two unit property, and eventually started partnering with other investors. And the real thing that happened was uh, back in 2008, while I was in Detroit working at GM, um, many of your listeners know that, you know, the economy just kind of collapsed and I was in the automotive field and we had a really tough time. And I watched a lot of my colleagues get let go and we had multiple rounds of layoffs and it really forced me to think about other ways to create income and protect myself in case I ever did lose my job. And that really got the ball rolling in the real estate space for me. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Now, how maybe you can go through your, your house hacking experience. Did you know that was before or after 2008? Sorry. That was after. That was 2012. So okay. I, I was I was convinced to get into real estate because of the economic crash. Mm-hmm. Um, although the market did not react accordingly. So in 2008, I'm still in Detroit. Markets crashed in 2009. And I'm starting to get really interested in real estate. So I'm reading everything I can read. I'm listening to everything I can find. But when I look at actual properties and talk to actual investors, all I see is fear. You know, properties are dropping. Anybody I knew who owned property was trying to sell it at fire sale prices. So it was pretty clear that the market was still in decline and it wasn't the right time to buy. So Mm -hmm. it wasn't really until I left Detroit, because keep in mind, I was, you know, I was looking for properties for a couple of years. And then eventually I just realized, you know what? I'm not from Detroit. Um, I'm from Cleveland. I really wanted to be in Chicago. Uh, I wanted to diversify from the automotive industry. I said, why don't I just go to Chicago and find a property there? So at that point, I decided to stop and wait. I got married. We moved to Chicago. And that's when I found uh, my first house at a two-unit property. Okay. Now, were you... I've done the same thing, actually. It's how I got started was was house hacking on a duplex. So maybe you can just kind of go over the the finances of how that worked. You know, did you... Were you getting paid to live there with uh, renting it out or breaking even? Or, you know, how how was it for you? Yeah. So, I mean, a house act for those who are, are not familiar with the term is just living in one unit and renting out the other units, right? Mm-hmm. So we bought a two-unit building. We lived upstairs. We rented out downstairs property. Um, I I think the property, we were paying about $2,400 um, a month on the mortgage. And my first floor resident paid about $1,400, $1,500. So they right. paid the large majority. I paid about $900. Mm-hmm. Um, but that includes taxes and insurance and everything else. I just remember the, the okay. total mortgage number. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that includes all of that stuff, right? So mm-hmm. we're out of pocket about $900. Bucks. But yeah. one of the strategies I think is really important for people is if you're going to take this strategy, live in an area where you want to live. Right. You know, I think a lot of times people try to just be 
all about the numbers and sacrifice so much that their quality of life takes a hit. And if you haven't built up momentum, it may be too much for you too fast, right? Mm -hmm. So we lived in an area called North Center, which is a really nice neighborhood in the north side of Chicago. And that area saw a huge amount of appreciation over that time. And what ended up happening for us, we fixed up our unit, fixed up some other things with the property. And that property actually appreciated in value significantly to the point where we were able to take out a six-figure line of credit on it. Nice. So I really think it's important to invest in areas where you do want to live anywhere anyway. Mm -hmm. um, because you don't feel like you're really sacrificing that much, particularly if you already live in an apartment, that would be an easy right. transition then. Yeah. Uh, but then also you're going to have residents who are like neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to be like-minded individuals. They're going to take care of their stuff. It's not like you're going to have them banging on your door at three in the morning to <laughs> you know, come fix something that's really minor. So right. I think that's really important as well. But on the number side, we bought it for 342, or I'm sorry, we bought that for 362K. Um, we put three and a half percent down, so not not a whole lot. Yeah. And we actually got a seller credit at closing because nice. there were some things that we needed to get fixed. We actually got a check at closing instead really? of uh, yeah, we got a check at closing. We nice. put down our initial deposit. We went through our um, due diligence. There were some things that we wanted to get fixed. The furnace was old. We knew it was going to blow. It actually went out three months after we bought it. Mm -hmm. uh, but the furnace <laughs> was old. There were some other things that we just wanted to credit for. So we ended up yeah. leaving closing with a check. And then we had saved up so much money for the down payment and we only had to put three and a half percent down. We assumed we had to put 20% down. So we had cash to put back into the property for the mm -hmm. renovations. So that's exactly what we did. And like I said, by doing those things, we were able to create enough equity where two years later, we pulled out a six figure line of credit. That's incredible. What a great strategy to walking away from closing with a check. You can't beat that. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't happen all the time. I mean, but yeah, I mean, it's but, a great strategy if you can if you can replicate it. Yeah, exactly. So, so what happens next? So you you pull the line of credit for you know six figures, and I think you said you started flipping houses after that, right? And so yeah, so so the next move was a three unit rental, right? So uh, and for us, the house hack was great, but it it kind of felt like cheating, right? Because right. the numbers didn't really matter as much. I was going to need a place to live anyway. Mm -hmm. So it was like, okay, this is fine. You know, we can fix the stuff if uh, if it's something super minor, if it's a little bit more involved, we can get some handyman involved. Uh, but the three unit property was a pure investment, right? So that one, the numbers really did have to work. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to make sure that the property is something that we can manage. And my wife was pregnant with our first child at the time. So I didn't want something that would be um, time consuming, where it's mm -hmm. heavily involved in the renovations and I'm over there all the time. So we bought something that was more stable. And in talking to our real estate agent that we found, and she had, you know, carved out a niche, um, folks on two to four units. So uh -huh. she found a three unit property from another one of her clients. And she's the one who actually told us that we probably had a lot of equity in our first home. Mm -hmm. We didn't believe her. I just, it, it had only been a year and a half. So we just didn't believe her. And right. she was like, no, when'd you buy that? How much you buy it for? She's like, I think you have a lot of equity in that. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. And yeah. she's like, no, I, I think you really do. <laughs> so we bought the three unit and then we refinanced or we looked into it because she kept pushing us. So we did. And we realized we actually did have a lot of equity. She was right. So that opened the door for us to go out there. And at that point, for us, once we realized how much equity we were able to create in that first property. Right. It made this real estate investing real mm -hmm. and it made it something that we wanted to do a lot more of. So then the strategy started to evolve and then we started to, you know, read even more and network even more <laughs> and connect with more people and, you know, think about mentorships. And at mm -hmm. one point we consider paying a huge amount of money to join this really big, massive, nationally known mastermind. Mm -hmm. And instead we decided to use the resources that were around us. And ultimately that led us to buying an eight unit building, right? A commercial property. Uh, we managed professional management companies. And I did all this because it was, I was starting to gear up towards working with other partners and working mm -hmm. with other investors and starting to build up that credibility to, to feel comfortable moving into that space. And eventually sure. I ended up hiring a mentor around that same time as well. So a lot of things in that process, I did start flipping shortly after that. That was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> and we can talk more about that as well if you want to. <laughs> yeah, I would love to hear. Uh, I mean, I've done some flips in the past as well, but I'd love to hear your experience and kind of why you decided uh, 
to go multifamily versus single family flipping, if you don't mind. Yeah. So for me, I think it comes down to your goals first and foremost. A multifamily was always the thing that I was focused on. It's everything we were doing up to this point. Small multifamily in the residential space, but still multifamily. Mm-hmm. And the flipping for me was only a men's 20. And the goal there was to generate enough income that I could put back into multifamily. Mm-hmm. And I remember talking to a friend of mine who had started to build a pretty big multifamily portfolio. And her advice to me was everyone she knew either did one of two things, bring on partners or flip properties and then take that flip money and put it into multifamily. Mm-hmm. So I decided to try to do both. And I was going to talk to investors, but at the same time, I was putting my money into some flip projects so I could try to flip that capital. Sure. And the issue was that relied on me trusting and fully uh, relying on another partner, a developer. Okay. and. While I wasn't a flipper, you know, I I knew enough about flipping where there were some red flags that I just missed, you know, Mm -hmm. I just ignored. And one of them is, you know, one of the first rules of flipping is like the 70% rule, you know, where all of your calls should be 70% of that ARV. Mm -hmm. And the developer we were working with, you know, his numbers were more like an 85% rule. So I'm like, hey, how are you able to do this? How are you making sure that there's enough cushion here where we can make profit and feedback that I was, don't worry about it. And at that moment, I probably should have worried a lot more to figure (laughs) out what my options were, but this person had a track record and I had interviewed them and I'd seen projects they'd done. And I've talked to other people that they, that would have worked with them. Right. Mm -hmm. I was talking to the contractor. So I felt comfortable because I could see it and I can touch it. And I was right there, but it just still wasn't making sense to me. And my lesson there is if you really aren't passionate about something, make sure you take even more time to vet the person you're going to partner with. But yeah. make sure that, again, if if the things you do know and the things you have learned, if that's being pushed aside, make sure you get a real answer. Mm-hmm. You know, if something like the 70% rule, if someone's saying, hey, that doesn't work or we're not doing it because of this, yeah. let them explain it and then see how comfortable are you with that explanation. If it mm-hmm. doesn't sit well with you, walk away. Yeah. If it does make sense and to say, hey, you know, here's what the numbers are going to be, or because we're doing X, Y, Z, it's a little bit different. Okay, great. But they mm-hmm. should be able to explain that to you. And if they right. can't, or they're unwilling to, that should be a pretty, red, pretty big red flag for you. Yeah, that's great advice. Absolutely. So how'd that, how'd that end up working out? Did you... No, they were terrible, man. What do you mean? (laughs) What do you mean? It's terrible. (laughs) Was that not clear from the setup? Uh, (laughs) No, they didn't work out at all, man. Um, What ended up happening is the deal structure was one where I took all the risk. Mm -hmm. You know, it was my name on the on the um, on the contract, so I technically owned the property. He only got paid after when we sold. He got fifty percent of the profits when we sold. But Mm -hmm. up until then, I was fully responsible. So once the project became clear that it wasn't going to create a profit, he had no incentive to even finish the job, right? He Mm -hmm. wasn't going to make any money on it. I'm still losing money every day. He's done. So what happens? He ends up walking away from it, right? So Mm -hmm. now I'm stuck trying to figure out how to finish this project. And that was one of the the hard lessons I learned is you want to make sure anybody you partner with, you have an alignment of interest, right? And our interests really weren't aligned. And I just didn't understand it or think about it. And part of it was because this person was doing these other deals and it had worked out on those deals, um, I didn't really think through, okay, hey, if this goes wrong, what does that mean for me? Mm -hmm. And because his margins were so slim, I didn't really have the means to to profit once he walked away because, you know, it was just, it was just not going to work. So for us, when we think about multifamily investing and I compare that to my flipping experience, there are a lot of variables that are that are different. And let's talk about just before we get in numbers, let's talk about high level strategy, just real realism things. Mm-hmm. One, when you're talking about flipping, you're talking about blue collar. Right. And what I mean by that is I'm talking hands on management. Mm-hmm. You got to make sure those workers are at that property every day. Well, yep. guess what? I had a full time job and two kids. So I was driving downtown Chicago to the office putting in my work there. I had to pick up the kids. And then I would swing by the property pretty much every night to yes. check in and see what work was done for the day. And if no work was done for the day, then I'm calling to say, hey, why well, was no work done for the day? But mm-hmm. at this point, it's late in the evening, right? Right. So, so then done. some days, now I'm working from home or I'm trying to work from the property or I'm you know, okay. coming over there on the weekends. And it's just really tough to manage people hands-on from that standpoint. If you're a contractor, 
is either a not on it like that. So again, it was great when I had a partner who was doing it, but once he walked mm-hmm. away and I had to do it all myself, it became very difficult and challenging to get that project finished. Right. Sure. So that's one thing, just understanding the real nature of the flipping business Two, it's a time clock game. You know, you are racing mm-hmm. the clock because if you are, you know, have a loan, you got heart money, you got a high interest rate. Every day you don't sell that property is a day you're losing money, right? Yeah, exactly. So that sucks tremendously. With mm-hmm. multifamily, it's not like that. One, you've got professional management companies that you can employ. Two, you're making money every day if it's occupied. And right. what you're really doing is managing the business plan. You know, you're managing the execution of that business plan, but it's not like you're racing against the clock. You know, mm-hmm. you can always, a lease is going to come up and you're going to try to do whatever you need to do to push rents on that lease. Yep. Uh, but you're not necessarily racing the clock where you're losing money. You don't have any money coming in. You always got money coming in on a multifamily. Mm-hmm. And then I would say the last thing for us is just, you know, the deal is completely done when you sell in in yep. um, in this single family space, right? Because yes, you can refinance and hold it and turn it into a rental. But when you're flipping, you want to get in and out as quickly as possible, which means all the work you've done and the money you've made great, but now you're done. You don't have any more money coming in through this asset that you just yep. spent this time developing. Mm-hmm. Again, on multifamily, you fix something up, you rent it. Now, yes, you're getting higher rents, but you've also increased the NOI, NOI the net operating income and the value of that property. So for us, I always knew multifamily was where we wanted to be, we wanted to stay, we wanted to focus. I tried to partner due to flipping. It was more of a distraction. I spent way more of my time running over that property, Funding, you know, funding that deal and mm-hmm. having to take my own money and put it into this project to get it done. It was a distraction. I would have been yep. way better served either doing one of two things, sticking to the multifamily. And I also could have invested passively, which would have been a great choice for me mm-hmm. because I was active on my own deals. But being a passive investor, since I did have that full-time job and I did have my two children and I was running around the city trying to make sure everything was being handled, that would have been a great way for me to still get into more multifamily deals and kind of diversify my portfolio and gain experience without having to take on all that work myself. Yeah. No, that's a great story, man. Incredible. And uh, glad you get out of that. I don't blame you. The single family game is definitely hands on. (laughs) So, so now, uh, so now you're doing larger scale multifamily. Uh, Maybe you can give us an example of a deal, you know, you've done recently. Yeah. So to talk about a recent deal, you know, I recently bought 104 units down in Louisville, Kentucky, and really excited about, you know, the deal, how things are progressing. Uh, For us, it was an interesting opportunity in the way that, one, we came about the deal, but then two, what the business plan is. Mm -hmm. And I will tell people, you know, any investors out there, they know it's tough to find a good deal in today's market. And if you're going to find a good deal, I think there are really two things that you have to look for. The first thing is you've got to find a deal that is either mismanaged and those are easy to recognize, right? Those are Mm -hmm. the deals where rents are way below market value. Um, You know, you can come in and fix a couple things up and get great value in a property. And those are deals that many of us are looking for, right? That's the traditional value add play. The challenge there is you just got to get the numbers to match up, right? Where what you're willing to pay matches with what the seller or the owner is willing to take. The other way you find a great deal though in this market is finding something that is mismarketed. And that is where the true opportunity really lies because Mm -hmm. there are a lot of deals that are not being put to put in front of a hundred other investors or being blasted everywhere that you think, or maybe they are visible, but the story that that's being told, doesn't match up with the real opportunity. So that's really where I think there's a unique ability today to find a good deal is to find these opportunities where maybe the business plan is a little bit off or you can be a bit more creative mm-hmm. with where you think the real play is. And that allows you to find that deal. And that's exactly what we did with Moss Creek was it allowed us to look at an opportunity where uh, it was being marketed um, to the masses, but the information that was being marketed really didn't tell the value at play. Even when you look at comp comp properties, they weren't pulling the right comp properties because this property was a new construction property and the comps were all, you know, 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And then this was a B-class property. So typically when you get new properties, they're A-class. Well, this was a B-class property. So you also Mm -hmm. couldn't go the other way and pull comps from the A-class new construction stuff, right? So I think a lot of investors couldn't figure out which comps to pull and just said, okay, hey, I don't think this is a fit. I remember the um, the uh, 
offer memorandum really didn't have a lot of information in it either. So for us, it took a little bit more due diligence and digging into the story to understand, hey, what could we do here? And as we dug, we liked what we saw more and more. And that really created an opportunity for us. Hmm, interesting. Now, for your um, for your deals, do you do mostly broker relations or do you go off market or how do you how do you typically source your deals? Yeah, I think having strong broker relationships is absolutely key. Um, mm-hmm. You can certainly go off market. What I will tell you is that um, even going off market, you have to have a strong relationship because, you know, I think some people are looking to put together a postcard and, and mail that to an owner. And the reality is that works on maybe two to four units or some of the smaller uh, commercial stuff. Mm-hmm. But anybody who owns a 100 unit or 200 unit apartment building, they're not going to, you're probably not going to get the postcard to the right person for starters. Right. Two, if you somehow luckily get the postcard to the right person, do you think they're going to call you and say, hey, man, I got your postcard. I'd love to sell you my property. Absolutely no. not. Right? I mean, how many postcards do you get for stuff that you don't really care about right now? Yeah. Exactly. Anybody who's that sophisticated and is that accomplished to own a 200 unit apartment complex, they know the best deal for them to make is mm-hmm. by either going to a broker or formally listing this property with yep. qualified buyers. It's not going to be to respond to a postcard. So mm-hmm. I just think that there's got to be some logic in how you approach it based on your business plan and based on the size, the assets you're looking for. Again, two to four units by all means. You can go direct to seller. You can do the campaign route. Um, you know, five to 20 space, I agree. Even up to 50 units or so. And yeah. you get above that, It could work, but I mean, you're really shooting in the dark. I mean, it's a matter of luck because those are situations where someone has already decided and maybe they just haven't called or listed it with that broker just yet. Mm -hmm. And if if you can make the offer that day, great, they'll do it. But you're, you're probably, you know, playing in a very tight window and it's more about, again, just the quantity. I mean, if you're going to call a thousand owners and yeah, I'm sure you might find somebody who, was thinking about selling today. But again, there's every other aspect of being able to meet their needs. And then on the reverse of that, you now have the reverse psychology of them thinking of, well, maybe I could have got more in the open market. So sure. one thing I like to do is say, hey, if you have a great broker relationship, um, maybe there's a deal that they had a hard time selling. And in that case, well, they've already listed. They've already put it in front of the market. The market's reacted. The market's mm-hmm. given them feedback. Yep. Now, maybe you could come in with something that's a little more, if you want to say realistic, we could say realistic, but maybe they're more willing to work with you on their number if they've had a chance to put it in front of the market. But until they have that, there might be a little bit of remorse on their part where even if they agree to a number, maybe that sales process or that closing process becomes challenging because in their in their heart, they're concerned that maybe they lost, they're leaving a lot on the table. Mm-hmm. I totally agree with you, especially any sophisticated seller these days with the market conditions is going to go to a broker. You know, they're looking for top dollar, 15, 20 offers at least. <laughs> so I, I agree. So now you're out of, out of your corporate uh, job and you've done you know, quite a few deals now. How has the passive income affected your family life? Has it made, I mean, obviously quite a big difference in, in your day-to-day life, right? Well, it's, it's given me more flexibility. And I think that's really the key. You know, when you talk about passive income, the way I see it is it's really about getting passive income to pursue your passions, right? Mm-hmm. And if you have family that you want to spend more time around, great. If you want to golf or play tennis or some sort of sport, great. If you have other leisurely activities you want to do or traveling, great. It doesn't really matter what you decide you want to do. It's a matter of how do you create the flexibility and take more control, you know, sure. kind of going back to the start of my story when I was in automotive, one of the challenges that I saw was all of my peers who were more successful, right? My bosses, my peers, the people who had been at that company, none of them looked happy to me at that time. And it was tough for everybody, right? There's a lot of anxiety yeah. going around and your job was always on the line. We had to hit, you know, certain sales numbers and I get it. I'm not knocking that. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying is there was not a single person in the organization that I looked at and said, you know what? That person looks happy. I want their life. Oh, that's not true. There is one person. His name's Jack. And Jack always had a smile on his face. And Mm -hmm. I love Jack. And I enjoy talking to Jack. Jack was an older gentleman who eventually did take an early retirement. But Jack didn't need the job. Jack enjoyed the job and did it because he wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. Jack owned some real estate. He owned some acres in different parts of the country. But I knew Jack had other real estate investments. And that gave Jack a lot of power and control. And Jack somewhat influenced me to say, you know what, 
don't be like the person with the big title. Because Jack didn't have a big title. Jack sat in the row, you know, next to my row. Hmm. Uh, he didn't have one of those offices or the suites or whatever, right? Sure. There was no door on uh, on his in his office. <laughs> yeah. But out of all those people, Jack's the one that came to work with a smile on his face every day. And Jack probably had more money than most of those people as well. <laughs> probably. And Jack is the guy that I always wanted to emulate, you know, mm-hmm. not just getting that that new title, getting that new bump and adding all the stress and anxiety just to have it. So sure. for me, it was very important. And the reason it was important was so I could be a more present father, right? Um, at that time, I didn't have kids, but I knew the kind mm-hmm. of father that I wanted to be. And now I've got two boys. I coach my my youngest in, uh, in flag football. Oh, nice. I get to be here, you know, when they go to school and they come home for school, I get them. So my work day, I can schedule to start and end at the time they're away at school. Right. And I just think that's great for us. You know, we can take trips, we can do different things together. And I think for anybody who's looking to create a life that they can control, you may not be in a position to quit your job right away, but I do think you want to be more like Jack, right? Mm -hmm. Figure out how do you create some passive income so you have a bit more power, you have a bit more options, and you're not miserable in a job. Or even if you love your job, at some point, maybe you won't love it, or maybe there's a change in your family situation where you need to be closer to someone. So for me, it's more about how do you insulate yourself from the things you can't control so that you have more control over the way anything can impact you? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Time freedom is the number one thing people want. You know, if, once you hit your passive income number, even if it's three, 4,000 a month, just to get out of that, or at least have a backup plan is uh, the way to go. So what would be, what would be your number one takeaway from this episode you'd want our audience to absorb? You know, I think the first thing is act with some intention, you know, be very intentional about what you want to get out of investing, assuming that you've already decided that you want to invest. So if you haven't made that decision yet, you should invest in real estate. Great. Sure. Uh, but there are multiple strategies. You could flip, you can house hack, you could get in syndications, you could be an LP or a limited partner uh, in a syndication. You could be on the active side or a GP, general partner in syndications. Figure out what you actually want, though. And then mm-hmm. that should help carve out the strategy If you're early in your career, early on investing, young person, I highly implore you to consider a house hack. I think it's a phenomenal strategy. You can get in on a deal with just three and a half percent down. If you are a former military or or military professional, you can get in with VA loan with zero percent down. Incredible. I mean, just incredible. You cannot beat these opportunities. This is free money, Mm -hmm. you know, that you can pretty much get in on these deals that start building equity and wealth for your family. So that's one strategy. Flipping. There's nothing wrong with flipping. Okay. It's not my strategy, Mm -hmm. but there's nothing wrong with it. For me, it didn't work because I had a full-time job. I had, you know, family, I had other obligations and I just didn't have the ability to babysit contractors and workers and make sure everybody was there. And it was Mm -hmm. racing against the clock and it just was way too much for me. And it wasn't building real wealth for us. Mm -hmm. Um, Multifamily, though, is a strategy I think can work for most people, particularly busy professionals, whether you want to be a limited partner on a deal or you want to figure out how to be active, uh, it can work. You can scale, you can hire professional management companies, and then it becomes how do you manage the managers? And that is definitely a big piece of what this business is. And you can partner with people. And this is all about teamwork and partnerships. Mm -hmm. So get intentional about what it is you want to see in your life. You know, what do you need to do financially to make that happen? And how can real estate help you achieve those goals? Yep. Well, my final question for you is, if you could step into my shoes for the interview, what's one question that you would ask yourself that I didn't ask you? Man, that is a great question. Uh, One question I would ask that we didn't really talk about, and I I get it frequently, um, but how can you leverage the skills you already have to transition into multifamily investing? So for me, obviously, that is um, with with marketing being my background since I did 15 years in marketing. So one of the big things for me is every business really is about a brand, you know, and we can say the word, but a brand is just how people view you. You know, we all have a brand, a personal brand. Uh, If I say Nike, you think something, right? Exactly. Great design, it might be athletic wear, it might be shoes, it might be slogan, the best athletes yeah. in the world, it might mm-hmm. be just do it, right? Yep. All of those things are, are parts of who you are. A brand is the ethos, right? It's just the yep. core mm-hmm. of who you are. And some people may not 
see your brand the way you want them to see it. Maybe they only see one side of it. You know, right. maybe they only see you as a podcaster because that's all they've gotten to see or know. Mm-hmm. And you can evolve your brand. So understanding that I think is really key. And if you can do that and you can think about your business that way, then you can start to understand how do I connect with other people? How do I grow this business? How do I actually have success in this space as opposed to, you know, just playing in the area I am today? If you really want to grow and impact things and be intentional about the results you want, you really have to think about it from that standpoint. If you're going mm-hmm. to work with other investors, what if, what have you told them about you? What brand do they see? Do they think about when they hear your name or they see the things that you're telling them? You've got to actually spend a lot of time to cultivate that and share and build the brand that you want people to see. Yeah. Great question and great advice. I totally agree with you. Uh, so now how, how would people reach out to contact you? Social media, email, you know, whatever you want to give. I think there are two things, right? One, we've got our podcast called Multifamily Insights. If you enjoyed this show, check out the Multifamily Insights podcast where we get into everything you need to know about multifamily investing. And then second, we put together a sample multifamily deal. Uh, this is a syndicated deal. So whether you want to be you know, more passive or you want to be more active, I think it's a great way just to get your head wrapped around the terminology, the deal structure, what to look for, all mm-hmm. of those kind of things. So if you ever had questions about that phase of it, Check out our sample deal. It's casmancapital.com slash sample deal. Great. So now we get into our five to thrive section. This is the last part of the show. It's a word association game. So basically, I just have five words. I'm going to just go through rapid fire and just give me the first word or phrase that comes into your mind. Only caveat is you can't repeat your answer twice. All right. All right. Ready? The first one is diversification. Necessity. Generational wealth. Priority. Nice. Apartments. Cash flow. Passive income. Transition. Hmm, interesting. And Casman Capital Group. Integrity. I like it. John, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Great time talking to you and all your listeners today. Absolutely. We'll see you soon. 